we've got a little story to tell. It starts out sad, but it ends up happy. So that makes it the best kind of story. After five months at sea, a band of weary men came to rest at this spot. They called it Jamestown. Five months cramped in three tiny ships, the Susan Constant, the Godspeed, and the Discovery. They weren't the first to the New World, of course. Lots more had come before the Spanish looking for gold, the British and French looking for fish for the markets of Europe. But these lonely souls here at Jamestown, they were determined to stick it out. They built a fort and set up their lives behind the barricades, and with good reason. Troubles with the Indians, so they couldn't farm the land outside, so, for food, they relied on fish caught in the river and salted down, and not much else. It was a barren place inside the fort, and that first year was a harsh and hard time. When it was over, there were only 38 left. 38 out of 104. Later, others came, and the colony began to grow. But always, they depended on the abundant fish. And, without actually realizing it, they started a kind of trade, a commerce, an industry. And the beginnings of this industry, that's where our story gets happy and better. After Jamestown, there were other colonies. A hundred or so came over on the Mayflower and settled in Massachusetts. They even had a charter for fishing. Virginia, New England. Slowly the land in between began to fill in and always they looked to the sea. Captain John Smith, the leader at Jamestown, had lots to say on the subject. And is it not a pretty sport to pull up two pence, six pence and twelve pence as fast as you can haul and veer your line? If a man work for three days and seven, he may get more than he can spend, unless he will be excessive. <laughs> well, well, the fishermen and the economists today might take some issue with that. It takes more than three days of fishing for a good living, these men can tell you that. They've been out for 10, 14, 20 days. That's the way they do it now. Off the Virginia Capes and New Jersey and New York, out of Point Judith, Rhode Island, and off of George's Bank. That's where these fellows have been. Chances are they won't get more than they can spend, but it's their life, and they wouldn't change it. Neither would this man. He's the auctioneer. They call him Jimmy Funny Man. But he can't even say how he got the name or how long he's had it, but no matter. He auctions off the fish at the Boston Fish Pier nearly every morning. Everybody? Everybody done? 73? One, 73. It's a funny thing about Jimmy Funny Man. He's too busy to stop and think about it, but he's part of this big industry that's spread across the country. In fact, they call it America's first industry. A lot of it started in the small villages and towns that dot the New England coast. Picture postcard towns. And hidden behind the scenery, sort of tucked away, you might say, are the people of the seafood industry. People like Jimmy Funny Man, and the fishermen and the buyers he knows, and people like Shannon Cushman. He's a lobsterman, 
and he lives in Port Clyde, Maine, a postcard town, if there ever was one. He gets up nearly every morning of the year before day and goes down to the co-op pier to start his day's work. His work is catching lobster. Cold, fresh and sweet for the dinner tables of the world. I've lived in Port Tide pretty near all my life. I lived in Tomston for five years. Moved back to Port Clyde again. I was born, brought up here. Father, he was lobster a fisherman all his life. And I've been going at it about 25 years. Now my son's at it, and I get another one growing up, he might be in it, anything to go for. Grandfather, father, and son. That's the way it often happens in the business. Up early and out on the water, rain or shine, cold or hot, pulling the lobster pots they've set on the bottom. Used to pull them by hand, but now they use motorized winches. Still, there's an art to it, pulling, inspecting, emptying those that are good for keeping, they call them keepers, or sometimes counters, and throwing back those that are too small, or too big. Some of them lobsters I'd ha have to measure wouldn't go this year, be good counters next year. Be of size. When the sharp ones, because we have to throw all back, against the law to keep them. They follow the law, these lobstermen. They know the value of conservation, of taking just what is good and proper for the taking, and leaving the rest. They have to be in size, the small size, three and three sixteenths, and the big size is five inch. Anything over, you have to throw back change the lots. They get scarce, silver done. Too many traps in the ocean. Most of those who are in the business stay in it, one way or the other. Right here beside Route 1, just outside Wiscasset, Maine, Philip McClellan. He used to be a fisherman. Now he leaves that to his brothers, but he's still in the business. Well, I sell fish. As you, as you can see, by all my signs. Uh, we've had quite a successful business here. We've been at it for five years, and we're open seven days a week. And the only time that we do miss is when you have a heavy snowstorm in the winter. But it is, it's a good business, and we build our reputation up because of, of things being fresh. Fresh. That's the key. And Philip McClellan knows that, and he practices his craft follows his profession with skill and with interest. And we try for our customers to get them the freshest possible. All, all local stuff if we can do it. Like as, such as crab meat and fresh fillets, whole fish. And as you can see, all these coolers I have here are right full of ice. They're nice, nice coolers. And they keep everything nice. And any of the customers that stop here know you know, know my routine, that I do get it local if I can. And that's, uh, that's a success. I've always liked people. And believe me, you meet a lot of them out here. They all get up early, these fishermen, in Boston, Port Clyde, down in Virginia, too. 
Matter of fact, if you're thinking of fishing for a living and you like to sleep late, well, you'd best think of something else. This is the general store at Menchville, near Hampton. They gather here in the morning to buy supplies and trade stories and to wait for the first light. These men are oystermen, working on the James River, not too far from Jamestown, as a matter of fact. And nearby, close around, are others who meet early and then go after clams and crabs in Virginia and up in Maryland on the Chesapeake Bay. These fellows, too, are sort of tucked away between the big cities or the suburbs, still going about their work, kind of loners. There's a song about the fishermen, it's written by a young man named Gordon Bach. It's a romantic song and kind of sad. It's about the old days and old ways of fishing, so it's, it's not too accurate for today. But it sure says a lot about the feelings these people have for their work. When the wind's away and the wave away, that crazy old fool will go out on the bay. Dodge in the ledges and set in his gear And go back when the wind drives him in And he knows full well that fishing is done His credit's all gone and the winter has come But as sure as the tides will rise and run He'll go back on the bay again When the snow is down on the western bay That fool will go running the fiddler's ground All in his gear in the trough of a sea As if he'd no mind of his own And he knows so well that fishing is done His credit's all gone and the winter has come But as sure as the tides will rise and run, he'll go back on the bay again. While his father's gone and his brothers have gone, but still he goes down on the dark of the moon. Rowan the dory and set him the twine And it don't even pay for his time And he knows full well that fishing is done His credit's all gone and the winter has come But as sure as the tides will rise and run He'll go back on the bay When the wind's away and the wave away Our children go down on the morning sun They go rowing their little boats out on the tide And they'll follow their foolish old man While you blind old fool, your children are gone And you never would tell them that fishing is done Their days were numbered The same as their foolish old man. Meet the new fisherman, Captain Richard Harris. He sails out of New Bedford with a mixture of romance and a hard-nosed sense of business. Well, I'm a commercial fisherman. I've been doing it for, oh, probably the last 12 or 13 years. I'm uh, at the present time skipper of my own boat, which I just bought a few months ago, and we're trying to make a, make it work. We're uh, primarily fishing for yellowtail flounders, and we've gone out of New Bedford uh, for the most part nine or ten days at a time. We're home for three or four, and we do this on a year-round basis, uh, weather permitting. I think it's salt water in your veins. I don't think it's, <laughs> you just, it's something that you go and some people go and never go again and other people go and can never stop going.
Next time you're in Captain Harris's home port, New Bedford, stop in at the Seaman's Bethel, the chapel where the whaling men used to worship before going out to sea. Herman Melville sat in one of the pews, and he might have picked up some ideas for Moby Dick. He wouldn't have had to look too far. make it to Butler's Flats each and every trip, I thank God that I have made it. And safe to be, you know, glad to be home and safe in the harbor. And just uh, worry about the next trip. This trip is over, and whether it's good or bad, it's over, and uh, we just start again in four or five days and do the best we can with whatever we can catch. I think the biggest thing is my love for the sea, but uh, you're never limited to, as to how much money you can make. The potential is there. If you're lucky and you get a big trip and a big price, you make a big dollar. And I have a large family and I have to feed them the best way I can, and this is the only life I know. Just as they do in Boston and other places, they gather here at the auction. Eight o'clock sharp. The fishermen, the buyers, those who come to spend some time and chat with friends. It has an easy air to it, but it's commerce, big business. While his men wait aboard with a catch, Captain Harris goes to the sale. He has his big trip and he'll soon know whether he gets the big price and the big dollar that he's counting on. Big or small, he'll still do it, going out on his own boat, the Marissa Ann. It was named for his daughter, by the way. He sells his catch, takes it to an unloading dock, and there it makes its way to the marketplace. It's a long way from the catch to the marketplace. A lot happens in between. What happens exactly depends on what the catch is, the product. These folks work in the town of Saxis on Virginia's eastern shore. Eddie Lewis and his friends and workers. Their catch is soft shell crabs. When the crabs are ready to molt, they're placed in holding tanks. And when they shed their outer shell, they're taken within an hour. 
And it happens any time, day or night. They get up early in lots of cases. They, uh, they stay up late. And lobsters, too. That's a 24-hour business because fresh lobsters are in demand around the world and they have to be kept fresh until they reach the customer at the other end of the line. They don't waste much time. The lobsters are packed live in ice and seaweed. They're sealed and rushed to the nearest airport. These may go to California or Chicago or even to Paris. Wherever they go, they'll be fresh when they get there. That's what it's all about. But fresh is not the only way. Sardines from Maine, caught fresh, then processed, cooked and canned in lots of different and lots of delicious ways. And other things, too. They've harnessed technology to come up with lots of ways of preparing and marketing seafood. All of them good. There's more than one good way to treat a fish. This lady knows just about every way to treat a fish for the dinner table. And small wonder. She's a celebrity wherever people see her television programs or read her books. Her name is Julia Child. She's a pretty good cook. And part of being a good cook is knowing how to buy things for cooking. And how to keep them. Mrs. Child lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Not too far from the fish piers of Boston. So she favors fresh fish and knows what to do with them. Now when you're buying a fish in the market, it's very important that you look very, very carefully at it. Its eye should be bulging. Can you see how that is a very clear bulging eye? And then look very carefully at its flesh. It should be glossy. And then if the fish has the gills in, and the gills are up at the neck part, and they're red, rather fringe type things, and also, if you can touch the fish, which is rare, the flesh should be firm and springy. If the flesh sinks down in, the fish is not very fresh. And then, of course, the best test of all is to smell it. It should have a lovely... <laughs> but that your nose is really the best test, test. It should have a very fresh and attractive odor to it. And then when you're buying fish fillets, Look very carefully at them. This is a filly, fillet of haddock. They should have a glossy, moist look also. And the, all of the surface of the fish should hold together nicely. There shouldn't be any gaps in the flesh in this. That's, they'd be boned. Here's another one. Here's a cod fish. This one, the bones have been taken out of it. But the green is all closed together and the fish is glossy looking. And then, equally important is buying the fresh fish is when you get it home and you're not going to cook it immediately, you want to keep it on ice. Take a bowl and put some ice in the bottom of it. And then take a plastic bag and put 
the fish fillet in the bag, put that in the bowl, and then ice on the top. Because the, the fishery people in the government have found that if you can keep the fish at about 30.5, it'll keep really very well for two to three days. And then put that in the refrigerator. And then re-ice, if you're not going to cook them right away, re-ice the fish about twice a day, dumping out the melted ice. It's ice and coldness that keep the, that keep the fish fresh. Well, that's all about fresh fish from me for today. This is Julia Child. Bon appétit. All over, they take her cue. Most of the seafood eaten in this country is eaten, enjoyed, in restaurants. But more and more people are beginning to add it to their home menus and finding out that keeping, preparing, and serving seafood is no big thing. You don't have to be a French chef to make it all come out right. And you don't have to have a gourmet's palate to enjoy it. If you do, then fine. But it's not required. So, the Shannon Cushmans, the Captain Harrises, all of those people tucked away in those scenic places, the folks who get up early, they've brought us all something. They've taken America's first industry and made it into something that touches nearly all of us. And in nice ways. So that makes their story a happy story. <laughs>